I'd first like to invite Roger Wells of FLIR Systems tonight, dinner sponsor, up for some remarks. Well, I'm certainly not one of the smart people, but I, uh, I appreciate the introduction. I had words prepared for tonight, but uh, as I was getting dressed this evening, my youngest son came into to my room and looked at me with a sad look on his face, and he said, he said, hey, Dad, are you going out of town again? Like many of you, I, I travel a lot. And I, I looked at him and I said, no, I actually have the honor of going to a dinner tonight where we get to celebrate Border Patrol agents and their families. And he got this big smile on his face, and he said, you mean like the guys on TV? Both of my boys are, are absolute Nat Geo junkies. And, and I said, yeah, th that's exactly what I'm doing. He goes, wow, Dad, those guys are totally awesome. I agreed again. They are totally awesome. But then I went on to explain the fact that they have a very hard and difficult and often dangerous job protecting the border. And he thought about that for a second and he looked at me and he said, well, Dad, I'm really glad you're going then. Those are the guys that keep the bad guys out of the country and they deserve to be celebrated. I agree. And uh, my son got it absolutely right. All of the agents and their families definitely deserve to be, to, to be celebrated, and, um, and they deserve much more than that. They deserve our respect, they de deserve our uh, admiration, and we, uh, we, we owe them a debt of gratitude for, for their service that they do. It's really a, an amazing thing that, that they are willing to uh, put their, their lives on the line at great personal sacrifice to protect this, this country. And uh, then my, my son went on to, to ask me if they were going to serve cake tonight. Well, I don't know about cake, but uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was right on the, the mark there. So, you know, I'd certainly like to uh, thank as an industry partner uh, all of the agents and their families. Uh, we're very proud to be able to provide the, the technologies and the systems that allow you to do your mission successfully and keep you safe in the field. And uh, we're also very pleased to, to be contributing to such a wonderful organization, the, the Border Patrol Foundation, who works tirelessly to uh, help and support the uh, families of fallen agents. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, institution, and, and the people that, that work for that are just, just fabulous. And I think not, I speak not only for the men and women of FLIR, but I think for, I speak for all of the industry partners when I say this. Uh, we couldn't be, be more happy to, to be here and celebrating with you. But going back to the conversation that I had with my son, I, I think it's more fundamental, more real than just a business partnership. Um, so as a father, I'd like to, to thank all of the agents and their families for the sacrifices that they make and uh, the, the service that they so, so tirelessly and willingly give to this great country of ours. Keep the, the country safe and, and keep our families safe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. For the presentation of colors and honoring of, of the fallen ceremony, I'd like to invite someone who knows a little bit or probably a lot about the U.S. Border Patrol, a third generation Border Patrol agent with one son serving in the Border Patrol as well today. Please join me in welcoming the president of the Border Patrol Foundation, Chief Ron Colber. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Roger, for those kind words. Um, all, of those, all of those of you that uh, know Border Patrol agents know that something always reminds us of a story. Uh, you were talking about your son. Uh, I remember many years ago, my Border Patrol agent son, when he was only seven years old, was watching me pack my gear my last night with my family before I uh, deployed to South America during the war on drugs era on special operations with Bortec. And uh, as I uh, said prayers with him, kissed him goodnight, and began to walk down the hall towards the master bedroom, he called me back. So I went and sat on the, his bedside and said, what's the matter, son? He said, uh, well, I still be a little boy when you get back. That just speaks to the, the family of the Border Patrol. And welcome everyone to the sixth dinner, fifth anniversary of the Border Patrol Foundation. You make this what it is. And uh, all of you are esteemed, respected leaders in your own right, and that's why you're here tonight. So again, thank you for attending, and thank you for making tonight very special. With that said, 
speaking of making the night special, uh, would, would you all stand for both the posting of the colors followed by the national anthem? Color guard, post colors. Please hunt. Please take your seats. We are going to show a brief video that is a tribute to the history, culture of the men and women of the United States Border Patrol. My name is Erica Aguilar. I'm a surviving spouse for Border Patrol Agent Luis Aguilar, who was killed in the line of duty on January 19, 2008. 
I know that he was very proud and I'm very honored to have the Border Patrol behind us and supporting us as well as our family. It's, it's very difficult to live up you know, organizationally to the expectations when we owe these families, the, the surviving family members of a fallen agent. Um, it's very difficult um, to find the words to express um, the level of condolence and sadness that we, that we feel for them. I felt like I wanted to give back. It was something in my heart that I knew I was not prepared for. Being a surviving spouse was just completely unexpected. Lots of challenges and battles that I had to go through. And I started to do a lot more with the foundation and raising awareness about what they do for um, our active duty families um, and also our surviving families and the scholarships that are available. Border Patrol agents primary responsibility first and foremost is to protect America um, and then you look at providing a level of safety of, and security to the citizens of this country um, who basically deserve no less um, and do so in very inhospitable areas, um, do so in conditions which are extremely dangerous not just to themselves um, but to the other agents that they're working with. Since the Border Patrol was founded, there's 120 Border Patrol agents who have given the ultimate sacrifice and service to this country. The table you see to my right is known as the missing man table. Honor guard.
outstanding. Much like the traditions in the United States military, the Border Patrol honors the fallen with their honor guard. As I mentioned, the table to my right, being guarded by the honor watch, it signifies the fallen that cannot be here with us tonight. Those that have sacrificed the ultimate so that we can enjoy this evening and return to our family safely. I look upon the scrolling list that was just viewed and pondering Chief Fisher's mention of 120 lives lost. That is not a boast. That is a sad and true fact of the challenges faced by Border Patrol agents every day and every night along our border. And it is a mission that is as important. And for those of you that have served in the military or currently serving, as important as what we do both off our lands and in foreign countries with our U.S. military. They are the protectors. And along that line, you also heard from Erica Aguilar. And at this time, I would like to introduce two surviving spouses who have joined us tonight. First, and currently, the director of our family services program within the Border Patrol Foundation, and whom you just viewed on, on the screen, Erica Aguilar, if you could stand, please. And Louis Jr. and Ariana, please stand. I had the honor of working with Louis in Yuma Sector. Um, we also now, joining us tonight, have Christy Ivey, surviving spouse of Border Patrol Agent Nick Ivey. Christy, could you please stand? It really is about these two families represented here tonight, so thank you. And we know you traveled a long ways from the Southwest to be here with us tonight, so thank you for joining us tonight. But it is about you, it is about the families, and the extended family of the Border Patrol. You know, I look upon that list and I look out here and I see uh, commissioners, former commissioners, I see former chiefs, Doug Crum, Chief Aguilar, current Chief Fisher, and you know what I'm speaking of. I look on that list and I count 16 names of people that I worked with, supervised, led, and knew as friends. So it truly does have a deep meaning for all of us, and I know all of you have friends on that list too. With that, I will bring Phil Mattingly back up, an honor guard, outstanding as usual. Thank you. <laughs> honor watch. Dismissed. It is now my honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, the fourth Secretary of Homeland Security, J. Charles Johnson. Prior to joining the department, Secretary Johnson served as the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, where he led more than 10,000 military and civilian lawyers across the department. Secretary Johnson's careers included extensive service in national security, in law enforcement, and as an attorney in private practice. Secretary Johnson was the General Counsel of the Department of the Air Force from 1998 to 2001, and he served as an Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York from 1989 to 1991. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Secretary Jay Johnson. Thank you very much. Secretary Chertoff, Commissioner Kurlikowski, Chief Fisher, uh, families who are here, uh, other distinguished guests, and Admiral Zunkoff, Commandant of the Coast Guard. Last but not least, my DHS public affairs officer, Todd Brazil, whose sole job here tonight, given that this is not open press, to protect me from Phil Mattingly. Um, the most frustrating job in Washington, I think, is probably the job of being my speechwriter, because what happens is somebody gives me a thoughtful address to give on occasions such as this, and then I look at it and I say, very nice, and then I write my own remarks. And so tonight you will get what I think and what I feel about the Border Patrol Foundation. Um, <clears throat> I apologize that I will need to leave early within the Department of Homeland Security, which includes the missions of counterterrorism, cybersecurity, health affairs, Ebola, Secret Service, ISIL. We've got a few things going on. It's been a tough week. <laughs> so I need to leave early so I can try to get a good night's sleep. Um, and one of the things that I'm working on is a speech that I am writing that I intend to give on Thursday about our border security efforts, principally the border security efforts of the Border Patrol. I intend to, with a lot of facts and figures, demonstrate the investment that this country has made in the Border Patrol, in border security, over the last 15 or so years to note the decline in apprehension rates, which is a very significant indicator of total attempts to cross the border, to note the rise in the number of Border Patrol personnel, uh, to note that our apprehension rate is the lowest that it's been since the 1970s, and to note that the spike in migration that we saw over the summer in the Rio Grande Valley sector, most notably of the unaccompanied kids, has dropped off dramatically to the point where it's the lowest level in almost two years, thanks to the work of the Border Patrol and others. But the one feature of that address that I intend to note is the outstanding service and the exemplary character of the men and women who serve in the United States Border Patrol. In my nine and a half months in office, I've been in, remarkably impressed by the character of the people who wear the Border Patrol uniform. During the crisis this summer in the Rio Grande Valley sector, I visited McAllen, Texas, the Southwest probably five times. And each time I'd go to McAllen Station, the processing center there, I would ask the Border Patrol personnel, what do you need? Tell me what you need to help get through this situation. And each time, they were optimistic, they were confident, they did not complain, they just did their jobs. And dealing with that number of kids, you're doing a job that is far beyond the job description. And each time I went, and we're talking about June and July in South Texas. It's hot, it's humid, the air is thick. Um, the Border Patrol executed its mission 
in what I regard as, and I'm sure the commissioner would agree, an outstanding professionalism, character, patriotism, which reflected well on, on our nation. And so every chance I have, and I really mean this, I note for the public and for the Congress and for the White House the outstanding character of the men and women who serve in the United States Border Patrol, our Border Patrol agents. Now, <clears throat> I also salute Chief Fisher for the work he has done along with Commissioner Kurlikowski to bring increased transparency I salute Chief Fisher for making public the Border Patrol's use of force policies, for revising those policies to more explicitly reflect uh, rock throwing situations involving vehicles. I su salute Commissioner Kurlikowski for his efforts at transparency and accountability. I believe the Border Patrol is moving in the right direction and I'm proud to lead a department that includes the men and women of the Border Patrol. I also have within the Department of Homeland Security the Secret Service. There's been a lot about the Secret Service lately. Let me say this about the Secret Service. I know them as managerial level supervision and I know them as a protectee. I'm a protectee of the Secret Service. The Secret Service are filled with remarkably skilled, trained, dedicated men and women prepared to put their own lives on the line in a moment's notice. Secret Service is with me 24-7. Weekend before last, I paid a surprise visit to my two kids in college in Southern California on very little notice. My daughter is a freshman in one college in Southern California. My son is a sophomore in another college in California. I'm under standing orders from my daughter. Dad, when you show up on campus, leave the protection detail behind, please. Don't make a big fuss. Leave chips, the California Highway Patrol, behind. You got to really skinny it down, Dad. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> So I went back to my daughter's college weekend before last, and I discovered <clears throat> there's this social media tool. You know, I'm a relic of, I'm, I'm 57 years old, so I'm a, according to my teenage kids, I'm a relic, you know, I'm living in my old time. But I discovered this social media tool that college students use called Yik Yak. Anybody here ever heard of Yik Yak? Yes. Admiral Zunkamp, interestingly, has heard of Yik Yak. <laughs> um, Yik Yak is this thing where kids on a college campus can, on their iPhones, get chatter, anonymous chatter on campus, what's going on on campus. And it, you know, it's, it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's anonymous, there's some, there's some, uh, somebody there who takes down the obscene, inappropriate stuff but it's chatter back and forth on a college campus. So I arrived at my daughter's college campus and Yik Yak lit up. And the dialogue went something like this. There are two Secret Service agents on campus. What up? <laughs> Barack Obama is here. Barack Obama is not here, chill out. He's in Delaware today. Malia is here, she's looking at colleges. Malia is not here, she's too young to be looking at colleges. Then my son, who doesn't even go to this college, he goes to another college, but he can get the yik yak on his iPhone. He decides to jump in for fun, to make fun of his dad. 
So he says, it's not Barack Obama, it's a Vin Diesel lookalike. <laughs> I don't know why he needs bodyguards. Somebody finally figured it out. They said, no, it's the fake Obama. The chief of Homeland Security, his daughter is a freshman here. Somebody finally ends the conversation by saying, they have guns, too bad. His daughter will never get a date in four years. Um, there have been, on my watch as Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, 12 Border Patrol agents who have died, two in the line of duty. I try to speak to the spouses almost immediately after the death. I said in my confirmation hearing that I will mourn the loss of every single Border Patrol agent and every single man and woman who dies, who works for the Department of Homeland Security. And I will never forget when I was the general counsel of the Department of Defense going to a dignified transfer at Dover when our fallen heroes come home from Afghanistan or Iraq. And I remember a couple of things about a dignified transfer I attended in November 2010. It was cold. There were several Marines coming home that evening. And for the families watching the families as they see their son's casket come off that transport jet for the first time when they see the casket. You can literally watch them crumble. You can literally watch them collapse as they see their 19, 20-year-old son's casket coming off that large jet. And <clears throat> it's particularly difficult because if there's been a divorce in the family. There's two family units there. And invariably somebody, one, one, one family unit blames the other for, why did you let him sign up for this? So it's awkward. And I <clears throat> remember asking uh, General Hoss Cartwright, who was then the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, what, what do I say to a family or a mother or a father or a wife in this circumstance? What can I possibly say to try to make it better? And Hoss said to me, there's nothing you can say. The only thing you can say that might get through to them is we will always be here for you. We will always be here no matter what happens to you or your kids for the rest of your life. We will be there to help you through this. And they will remember that. And so I've carried that forward. And I'm so grateful that this foundation in serving the families, honoring the fallen, is doing exactly that. I appreciate the sponsors here, the supporters of this foundation, who themselves have no direct stake in border security, but care about the families of those who serve border security and the border patrol. I really appreciate your, your service, your sacrifice, your generosity. Um, and it's foundations like this that give meaning to the words of people like me who say, we will always be there for you. I say that when I, I talk to a spouse of someone who's just, just died or been killed in action and so the work that you do and the support that you provide is incredibly important. I suspect that many people who serve today, whether it's in the Border Patrol or Coast Guard or Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, take comfort in knowing that there are foundations like this in the event that they are in a situation where they have to um, give their lives for their country, that when they leave their families behind, there's a foundation there to help the families. So 
From the bottom of my heart, I'd like to say thank you to the supporters of this organization for your time and your effort and your generosity and all that you do. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Secretary for his remarks. I'd like to thank Todd for his efforts tonight in keeping me away from him. Um, I do appreciate your willingness to agree to the three-hour sit-down interview in the Secretary's office tomorrow morning. <laughs> I believe you mentioned a number of topics at the very start um, that might be of interest to someone like myself. So, sir, you can just prep for that, the, the interview. <laughs> yes, I see you walking out. I'll get you tomorrow. Um, now, I'd like to uh, invite Border Patrol Chaplain Sean Hawkins to provide tonight's invocation. Our eternal Father in heaven, we gather together tonight with great appreciation to honor the men and women who have paid the ultimate price while protecting our country, our borders, and our citizens. We will forever remember their sacrifices and the great love they had for their country and the passion they had for the Border Patrol badges they so proudly wore. Father, for the family and friends who have lost a loved one, we ask thee for a special blessing of comfort and strength as they continue to heal. Bless them with the knowledge of our deep gratitude and respect for their tremendous loss. Envelop them in thy love. Father, at this time especially, we ask thee to bless and comfort the families of those Border Patrol agents who have so recently fallen. Bless the families of Border Patrol agent Alexander Giannini, Border Patrol agent Tyler Robledo, and Border Patrol agent Javier Vega. As these families go through this extremely difficult and tragic time, Father, bless us with the spirit of understanding and comfort as we remember the great and noble lives these heroes have lived. Bless us to always remember the sacrifices that have been given and allow these sacrifices to strengthen and motivate us to be better people and citizens of our communities. Father, we give thee thanks for the meal that has been prepared for us this evening. Please bless this food of which we partake, that it will be a nourishment and strength to us. In thy holy name we humbly pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think everybody knows that the U.S. Border Patrol works with a number of federal, state, and local agencies on a daily basis to keep the country safe. One of those agencies is the United States Coast Guard. Tonight, the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard is here with us to help honor the U.S. Border Patrol. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a 10 out of 10 chance I'm going to butcher the last name. He's aware of that. I'm almost positive because I've seen videos and talked to colleagues who have, with much better resumes than mine, uh, who have succeeded much more in their career, who have done the same thing. And frankly, if you go on YouTube, there's a video of Al Roker attempting to pronounce the Commandant's name for a solid minute and a half to two minutes. So if you're bored tomorrow at work, um, please take a look at Admiral Paul Zunkovs. Ah, I practiced that for like three hours today. I'll take 85% though. Uh, Admiral, uh, please welcome to the stage, Admiral Z. Well, I can't say what an honor it is here to, uh, to be here as a member of the military service, but more importantly, a, a law enforcement agency. And I want to thank BPF. Um, to look out for, for those who really put their lives on the line day in and day out. Um, I met Erica, I met Christy, um, and I, oftentimes when I have to make those very difficult phone calls to our members uh, who are killed in the line of duty, uh, none of our family members take that oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Um, they will uproot themselves, they will move to wherever duty calls us, 
Uh, they don't act, ask questions when we get that call in the middle of the night to say, uh, honey, I'm leaving, I don't know when I'm gonna be back. Um, but they clearly pay the price. Uh, but I would just ask, before I go any further, if we could give a standing applause for Erica, uh, and then to Erica and Luis, and, and to Christy as well. Thank you for your commitment. Now, the Coast Guard's roots go back to 1790, and at that point in time, Alexander Hamilton said, we, we need sentinels on our border, uh, men, because it was all men serving at that point in time, uh, that will exercise principle of restraint and good temperance. And so when you look at the vision that Alexander Hamilton had nearly 225 years ago, I don't think it was just the Coast Guard in mind. He had the Border Patrol in mind because... First and foremost, our responsibility was protect our maritime borders um, at a point in time where we had just divorced ourselves from the United Kingdom. Um, but when you look at the challenges we face today in a much more complex environment, I think the, the seeds that Alexander Hamilton planted nearly 225 years ago uh, resonate very much today with our Border Patrol. So I would, I'm going to give you credit for another extra year Chief, uh, in a few years beyond that, not just 90 years, but really the roots of this organization really go back 225 years. Uh, when we look at the threats, and especially today, and when I looked at that scroll, um, what really stood out is the frequency since 9-11 with which we're losing our Border Patrol agents. Uh, and so we are the sentinels on the sea, but we work very closely with our sentinels on the land. And quite honestly, I'm much more comfortable on a ship than I am on a horse. Um, um, but we, we speak with one another. Uh, and the beauty in this job is I get out to see our field units. And if Secretary Johnson was still here, he probably would have finished his talk about unity of effort. Uh, when I see unity of effort, uh, when I go to the galleys, this is where you go to our Coast Guard dining facilities and you can get a steak dinner, uh, a T-bone steak for $4.25 with all the fixins. Um, but when I go there and I say, who is breaking bread together? It's Coast Guard, it's Border Patrol, it's Customs, it's County Sheriffs, um, because we have figured out unity of effort when, where it matters, and that's at the field, field unit level. So I'm not all that concerned about unity of effort because those who are in the heat of the moment doing the mission, they've already figured that out. So. Uh, we've developed these regional coordinating mechanisms. You know, that was a brainchild of Washington, D.C., um, and then that balloon floated, and then it landed on our borders. And where I sit, where we have maritime borders and land borders, southwest borders, where some of those points intersect, our people have already figured it out. You know, they don't need Washington, D.C. to reach in with that 3,000-mile screwdriver to figure out how to make it work because they've already done it for us. Um, and so as we sit here in Washington, D.C., it is the font of all knowledge, um, but there are people out in the field units that, you know, perhaps they have figured it out for us. Um, but closer to home and what this evening is all about, you know, in the last, you know, since I've been commandant of the Coast Guard, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, I've had, you know, you make those phone calls, but then you go to the memorial service for my fallen shipmates. And when you go there, we've had the secretary or the deputy secretary, and the first thing you do is you expect to see a sea of blue. And the first thing I wanna do is I, I, I'm a half Scotsman and I wanna bring on these bagpipers. Um, but when you get there, it's not the sea of blue that you see, it's the sea of green. It's this interagency family of the Department of Homeland Security, but it's those of us that are protecting our borders, securing our borders. Uh, and when I see our Border Patrol agents there, for one of my fallen, um, there's not enough that I can do for this great service, this Border Patrol service that lays it on the line day in and day out in probably one of the most ambiguous environments that you can work in. Uh, when you serve, you lay it on the line day in and day out, and what do you have to show for it is, is rocks thrown in your face um, in the absence of a coherent policy. Um, they're the ones operating 
in that very difficult realm of in the absence of policy, you know, you are carrying out this ambiguous policy, um, but more more importantly, doing so in a humanitarian manner. Over 60,000 unaccompanied minor children have, have left their home to come to the United States. And so where I'm focused on right now is, well, why did they leave? Uh, well, the reason they've left is that eight of the 10 most violent countries in the world are in this hemisphere, our backyard as we speak today. And why did these backyards of ours become so violent is because about 400 metric tons of contraband, primarily cocaine, are destined for the United States. And these countries are nothing more than corridors. And these children, these families, they are the collateral damage of the demand in our country. Uh, and so if we don't step up to the plate and exert more leadership in this region, uh, we're going to see more and more of this play out. You know, our economy is growing. Um, energy is booming in the United States. We're producing two million more barrels a day of oil than we did a year ago. And in fact, in October 2013, we hit a point where we, our export and import of oil ha have reached stasis. And we're going to reach a point where we export more oil than we import. Our economy is growing. Mexico's economy is growing. Canada, uh, Canada's economy is growing. Honduras is a failed nation. Um, despite the best leadership of their, their president, um, Hernandez, Guatemala, El Salvador. So when you look at why are these kids leaving, it's the environment. And, um, and quite frankly, uh, we have contributed, uh, because of the drug demand in this nation, to the environment that exists. Um, and the pendulum is moving in the wrong direction. So as challenging as it is today for our Border Patrol, if, if we don't come up with a better approach of how do we address the causes, not the symptoms, of, of why people are leaving those countries to find a better life. Because quite honestly, you know, one out of nine young, um, young boys in Honduras will not live to see the age of 21. Uh, they certainly will not see the age of 30. They'll be murdered before that time. About 60% of the young girls, uh, according to Amnesty Inter International, are raped before they reach our border. Uh, this is a, a human atrocity playing out before us. Uh, our nation was galvanized when we realized that ISIL was beheading people. Uh, this tactic, this atrocity, has existed on our borders for years on end. This is nothing new in our backyard. But who is dealing with this day in and day out is people like this. It's Officer Aguilar, it's Officer Ivory. Uh, they are the ones laying it on the line day in and day out. So we, we're living in a very complex environment, but I am all in with our Border Patrol agent to do everything that we can do uh, to turn the tide that is cur currently flowing against us. Uh, but I could not have more respect for the largest federal law enforcement agency in the United States government. That is our U.S. Border Patrol, led by Chief Fisher. Uh, I could not have more admiration for what you do. And when I look at what your, your ethos is, honor first, um, ours is honor, respect, devotion to duty. Uh, the DNA is intertwined with both of us. So uh, I am very proud to be here this evening to speak for the Coast Guard, for the Maritime Border. Um, but for those of you, and especially those that have paid the ultimate price, what an honor it is for me to be here to speak for the 88,000 Coast Guard active duty, reserve, civilian, and then um, our, you know, all of our people in the Coast Guard. Uh, we lift our hat to you, and I would lift my glass to our Border Patrol. Happy birthday, number 90, but I'm going to give you credit for 224. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol, Chief Michael Fisher. I apologize, I'm just admiring how large this group is. 
and how much it has grown over the past few years. Secretary Chertoff, thank you, sir. Uh, you honor us with your presence here tonight. Uh, Ron, thanks again for the invitation. Admiral, thank you for those kind words. Mr. Commissioner, thank you for being here as well. So good evening, a special good evening and hello to all of you persistent recidivists out there, and you know who you are. <laughs> and for those who I've had the distinct honor to meet for the first time tonight, thank you very much for supporting the foundation. Tonight I have the honor of introducing our next speaker. Commissioner Kurlikowski was nominated by President Obama and sworn in on March of this year. As commissioner, he oversees the dual U.S. Customs and Border Protection mission of protecting America while promoting economic prosperity and security. He takes the helm of the 60,000 employee agency with a budget in excess of $12 billion. He runs the largest federal law enforcement agency and second largest revenue collecting source in the federal government. Most recently, he served as director of the White House, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Commissioner Kurlikowski brings four decades of law enforcement and drug policy expertise and experience to the position. He formerly served nine years as the chief of police in Seattle and was also police commissioner in Buffalo, New York. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Mr. Gil Kurlikowski. Commissioner. Thank, thank you all very much. Uh, if the Secretary said he was mistaken for the President, I can tell you that I was once mistaken a couple years ago for Justin Bieber. <laughs> and, and that actually is a true story, but there's a, there's a lot more to that story, and so I, 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 won't, uh, I won't bore you with that. But I remember in our black SUVs, uh, teenage girls running after us, screaming. <laughs> And we were behind the, uh, the dark uh, uh, tinted windows and not realizing that I wasn't Justin Bieber. Uh, Anna and I, my wife Anna and I, could not be more delighted and more honored to, to be here tonight to be with Chief Fisher. Secretary Chertoff, uh, congratulations uh, on the award, uh, 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 certainly so well deserved. And we're celebrating the great uh, achievements of the United States Border Patrol and its 90th anniversary. And I particularly want to thank the uh, uh, Border Patrol Foundation. When we went to Seattle in 2000, um, our award ceremony was Oreo cookies and lukewarm lemonade. And that was done at lunch, and nobody from the families were invited, and that was our ceremony. And uh, Anna and I together uh, formed a Se the Seattle Police Foundation uh, in 2001. Uh, the foundation now attracts, uh, at, a, at a wonderful dinner, almost 1,200 people. I think you'll be attracting 1,200 people very quickly also as the foundation recognizes and honors the good work of the uh, Border Patrol and also the remembrance and the history and the, uh, and the honor that goes to those families. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here tonight. I want to thank all of the current and former Border Patrol agents who are, are here tonight. Although I don't think, as, a, as uh, knowing the Marine Corps, I don't think there's such a thing as a former Border Patrol agent. Uh, over the 90 years, that culture and dedication to duty, the solidarity of mission continues to grow and strengthen the future of the Border Patrol and its good work to come. I appreciate uh, the uh, Commandant being here tonight. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful and, and rich tradition uh, in the Coast Guard. Uh, I had recently been in San Juan uh, when I saw the Eagle, uh, and I only saw the three masts going by. And uh, we were in the uh, uh, Port Authority office, and I said, oh, what is that, what is that great ship? I could just see the, the three tops of the mast. And it was the Eagle coming in. And when we were able to go on board and to get a tour, 
you'll be surprised that we cut our meeting short uh, so, that, so that we could go do that. Uh, to meet the cadets uh, on, that, uh, on that Coast Guard cutter and the, those that, are, that were in the academy and the foreign uh, uh, members that were also there, uh, it gives you such great hope for the future. When you meet the, the, the young men and women of the Border Patrol, it truly gives you such great hope for the future. The Border Patrol faces unique challenges, and uh, Mike and I think the uh, video and, and uh, has really, really kind of uh, uh, set that tone very clearly. Operating in environments and circumstances vastly different from just any other law enforcement agency, and guarding America's borders, keeping the terrorists and criminals out of the country, and at the same time facing challenges which are really unique to this country. For example, as we all know from all of the publicity and all of the attention that has been given uh, to the unaccompanied children, to the minors that were streaming across the border in uh, March and April and May and, uh, and even in through June, uh, I was in office less than or just barely over a week and had the opportunity to go to McAllen uh, and see a room filled with young people sleeping on blankets and Border Patrol agents trying to quickly feed them. I mean, it was when I came back to Washington and I sat down with a number of people and I said, you have a front row seat at a humanitarian disaster. And as we look at what will be, I think, 68,000 or so uh, young people that have come across and family units that have come across that border, I could not be more proud of the men and women of the Border Patrol for the way those individuals were treated. The fact that they were bringing uh, clothing from their own homes and taking care of these, all the while, uh, listening to the complaints of, uh, and, and truly, truly unfounded complaints of people who had a particular agenda, uh, which has to do, as, as the Admiral mentioned, which has to do with comprehensive immigration reform, which continues to be stalled in Congress, and then continues to make the life, the daily lives, of the men and women of the Border Patrol so much more difficult. And yet, they rolled up their sleeves, they didn't complain, and they handled this. And as the investigations progressed about the, the, uh, the allegations of complaints, one after another, every single one of those allegations fell away. There wasn't anything of substance to any of those allegations except the fact that the men and women of the Border Patrol and the way they treated those, uh, uh, those family units, uh, almost as if they were part of their own family, all the while doing their job, all the while protecting, uh, protecting the public. So I couldn't have been more impressed, and as I had that opportunity, as the Secretary also has, uh, uh, to spend that time in the White House, to spend it on Capitol Hill, and to spend it uh, with wonderful reporters that, that we all know, and to spend it with, uh, with reporters kind of talking about this from a factual, substantive standpoint about the work they do. And they do their work day in and day out. Out. And as we saw from the video, they put their lives on the line. They perform their duties with professionalism and pride. They embody the Customs and Border Protection's core values of vigilance, integrity, and service to country. Uh, the loss of those lives and the loss of, uh, through to those families is felt by, uh, by each and every one of us who remain on duty. And the examples of those who've fallen before us and who gave their lives to protect this homeland inspires us all. Agents are fallen heroes. Uh, we reciprocate their dedication and their work by honoring them with service, the vigilance, and unquestionable integrity. And the Border Patrol Foundation, I know, is going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to expand. And for all the times that we think that uh, uh, people don't recognize, appreciate, or understand the work of the United States Border Patrol, we know from this room and we know from so many others uh, how much good work is done. I think each of the agents, the family members, the people that are here uh, tonight uh, for your continued dedication and service. And I could not be more uh, honored along with my wife, Anna, to be here this evening and to be the, uh, uh, a confirmed commissioner of the uh, Customs and Border Protection after uh, far too long for a, a confirmed uh, individual. So thank you all very much.
Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh no, I don't. I don't doubt the veracity of the statement. I think the the question was is uh, look, it's Washington. I've got sources all over the place. The bigger question was, according to an individual familiar with you inside the car at that point, is why you looked to your driver and said, "Don't worry, this is normal." <laughs> that raises questions, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, before we begin the awards pro uh, portion of the program, uh, two things. One, silent auction reminder. The silent auction, come on guys. Like, look at what's actually out there. Go check it out. It's worth your while, it's worth your time. Um, also, we need to take a, a moment to acknowledge those who have made tonight's dinner possible. Oh, by the way, on the silent auction, you've got like 10 minutes, so this is serious now. Don't all rush out at once, but silent auction. Um, those who were involved in making this dinner possible, obviously none of this comes together um, without the, the, the sponsors who are actually willing um, to help put an event like this on. Tonight's dinner sponsor, FLIR Systems, um, and who we heard from earlier. Uh, tonight's reception sponsor, L3 Communications. Tonight's centerpiece sponsor, Adobe. Um, there are also a number of organizations that have committed to support the foundation each year through the National Partnership Program. Some of these organizations have been there helping the foundation grow since the very, very beginning. Um, I heard from someone earlier tonight that there was a time when this event was in a back room at the Army Navy Club. Look around, that's impressive. Um, over the course of six years. So on behalf of the entire foundation, including its founding members, uh, Mike Connors, Chief Colburn, please join me in thanking uh, the BPF, National Partners, Accenture, Boeing, Command Consulting Group, Elbit Systems of America, FLIR Systems Inc., General Dynamics C4 Systems, L3 Communications, Lockheed Martin, Motorola Solutions, Raytheon, SAIC, Smith's Detection, URS, and the Women in Homeland Security. And now to begin the awards presentation, I'd like to invite dinner co-chairs Irene Fisher and Kay Olive to make some remarks and tell us a little bit about the Foundation's Student Scholarship Program. So thank you so much for being here. I have this reluctant co-chair here who wants to just stand here and look gorgeous and make me do all the work. But I'm <laughs> determined to make her contribute a little bit to this. So um, that's your part. OK. All right. <laughs> so the first thing we want to do is say a huge thank you um, to everybody who put this on. So just a real quick note on the committee. And then we'll get, we're just going to do this really fast. But uh, Mike Neal with General Dynamics, who's on the executive committee for this group. And if you'd hold your applause, we've got several names to go through. Laura Johnson, who's amazing. Pat Wilder, our national director. Dan Dreyfus with Accenture. Bobby Brown with Telephonics. Nuri Vitello who you've already heard from, heard about over here, um, Irene Fisher, of course. And I want to point out, they, and that's the committee that have done all this. So look around you. It's just amazing what everybody can do pulling together as a team. There's a couple of pieces that we want to say thank you to beyond that. And the first one, um, I have to say a major, major kudos to Chief Fisher. If you'll look around you here in the room, starting right here, and in the reception hall, you'll see these absolutely stunning pictures of the United States Border Patrol. And we felt like it was very important to have things like this to really remind us of the mission and of what the agents of the United States Border Patrol do for us and for our country. So we are delighted to have these. And Chief, thank you so much. It, it is just such a wonderful addition to the event. And so not only did he do this, but we have this, these, this wonderful group of agents who, who carried these over here for us. Um, so I have to say a huge thank you. Uh, Scott Garrett's going to kill me, but Scott Garrett's kind of the one. Yeah, he's nodding. Um, Scott is the one who coordinated all this for us. So Keith Haynes, 
Omar Rabo, Frank Lamaster, Ryan Joy, Devin Reno, Matt Ibsen, Mark Simpson did an amazing job bringing these over, helping us with them. And I really want you to please make an effort to walk around. Those of you like us who are at CBP headquarters frequently so enjoy seeing these on the wall in the building. And we had a great time, Irene and I, traipsing um, with Jill Valencia, traipsing 10 floors of CBP picking out. And unfortunately for Scott, we started out, we had one yes, and then the second one was a maybe, and then the next 63 were a yes. And you could just see his eyes glazing over more and more and more. <laughs> so we did at least let him narrow it down to about 25 for us. So thank you so much for that. Um, I was asked not to do this because they like this. They like to be notified or noticed and, and congratulated only as a team. But I think it's incredibly important that we recognize the honor guard um, because these guys, we have wanted this for so long. And Commissioner, thank you so much for stepping out and making this possible for us, and Chief for following through and getting it done. Uh, Richard Fortunato, James Searle, Guadalupe Salazar, Robert Nila with the band, the color guard, Jonathan Martinez, Edward Hess, Michael Scioli, Raul Tamayo, Francisco Gaspar, and Jose Mercado. Thank you so much for all you do. We, we so appreciate you. She doesn't want to do anything. Okay, so actually, so have, I volunteered to, to uh, fill in a little bit please, about Rosalie. Please. Uh, uh, Mike Neal approached me just before the dinner and said, "You know, Chief, you've you've recounted this before at uh, these dinners, but uh, you and Mike have a story to tell." And uh, I would like to acknowledge Mike Connors, the first president of uh, the Border Patrol Foundation and founder of the foundation. And uh, Rosalie could not be with us here tonight. She has, and that is why she's being honored, she has one of the biggest hearts I've, I've ever known. The uh, day that we registered the Border Patrol Foundation as a 501c3 nonprofit organization in the state of Arizona on July 23rd, 2009, Mike flew into Phoenix from the East Coast to do this. That evening, unpredictably, Robert Rosas Jr. was murdered by bandits along the border at the Campbell Border Patrol Station in Southern California. And Rosalie became the first surviving spouse and recipient of our benevolence as a foundation. We were so new, one day old, that all the money we had went to Rosalie a few days later. So thanks, Mike, for planting that seed in those of us. And if you could, just for just one moment, all of those on the governing board and the founders committee, please just rise where you are so that uh, all of us can see who you are that make this real. And as I said, we, we formed this foundation to step up and bolster, encourage, provide moral support, and at times fiscal sustenance to these surviving families and these Border Patrol families in need. And yet it is the spouses that turn around and bless us with their volunteerism. As we mentioned earlier tonight, uh, the uh, director of our family services program, Eric Aguilar, is a surviving spouse. Rosalie, immediately after being the first recipient, joined our board and has, for the past five years, been a member of that board. Tonight, we decided to recognize her as the Volunteer of the Year. We would, on behalf of Rosalie, like to ask Erica to receive the, the awards. Erica, if you could come up, please.
join us? Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Rosalie sends her apologies that she could not be here this evening, but uh, I have spoken to her and she has sent a little message for each and every one of you in this room. She wants you to know that she is very humbled and very honored. And for your continued support and love to not only her family, but all of our families. She asks that God repay each and every one of you for your continued support to the Border Patrol Foundation. The Border Patrol Foundation stepped into her life on July 23rd to shine a little light in her darkest hour. I have become friends with not only Rosalie, but several of our surviving spouses. And I am truly grateful that we have each other and the network and the connection that we have to walk along this journey. And thank you to the Border Patrol Foundation, our Border Patrol that has embraced us and has cared for us and has carried us along and has never let us walk alone. And so a very special thanks also to my children because they have also been there walking this journey with me. And we have had our challenges and our struggles, but we continue to celebrate life and the life of our fallen heroes and it beats in each one of our hearts. So thank you for being here tonight to help us celebrate our life of the Border Patrol, the Border Patrol Foundation, and our fallen heroes. Thank you. So we have just a couple more things to do for you. Uh, before we remind you again of the silent auction, please bid early, often, and frequently, and big dollars, really big dollars, a great cause. Um, we want to also mention to you that the Border Patrol Foundation over the last three years has awarded over $100,000 in student scholarships to children of the United States Border Patrol. And so we're really, really proud of that. We have tonight one of the 24, 2014 recipients, Miguel Garibay, and I may be saying this totally wrong, um, but Miguel, can you stand up? I'm not sure where you are. <laughs> We just want to tell you what was so impressive about Miguel. In his application, he said, honor is the recognition of selflessness, pride, and unbending principle. It's the determination to stick up for what's right, even when the consequences outweigh the benefits. Honor is a way of life, a principle that cannot be said or expressed with words only. It's a principle that must be performed with unwavering determination and commitment. Congratulations, Miguel. That was amazing. The centerpieces tonight were made by a great group of volunteers. The Border Patrol wives wanted to volunteer in any way. And could you please stand up? I want you all to be recognized tonight. Jill Valencia, Martha Monsavayas, Ileana Moreno, Sylvia Enriquez, Monica Gallegos, Naomi Brustow, Sarah Harrington, Elizabeth Sanchez, and there's a wife from San Diego that worked really hard 
on the pictures that are on the centerpieces, which her name is Amy Smith. I thank you all for being so awesome and donating your time and talent. Thank you. And ladies, before you step off, on behalf of uh, the, the board and the Founders Committee, we would like to also present you each with one of these silver plates in appreciation for your hard work. Thank you. And thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of it. And I don't think you need me to be introduced by you again for the next one. I'll just walk right into it if you don't mind, Phil. Okay. Uh, each year, we've begun the tradition besides the volunteer of the award, award each year. Um, we have the Education and Awareness Award. And uh, in, in the past, we have honored such groups as National Geographic and their producers for Border Wars. The Hannity Show for the coverage of uh, fallen Border Patrol agents. And uh, this year, our awardees are some special people. In fact, there are a number of us, I believe, here tonight that serve on their advisory board, myself included, and thank you all for doing this. Eagle Eye Expositions adopted the Border Patrol Foundation a couple of years ago. And they have been so kind as to invite us each year to honor fallen officers at both the Border Security Conference hosted in Phoenix, Arizona by Eagle Eye, and in the past two years, the U.S.-Canada Border Conference. So uh, we are honored always to have representation and a presence and a moment to get the good news out about the foundation. And if it wasn't for Eagle Eye stepping up and saying, we adopt you, we want you to be a part of what we do to raise and elevate private sector industry partners such as Mexico, Central America, South America, law enforcement agencies throughout the US, state, local, tribal, and federal, and our partners in Canada about the challenges of securing ambos fronteras, both borders. So with that said, I would like to invite up our recipients that are, are representing Eagle Eye Expositions, Paul Mackler and John Moriarty. <laughs> Paul and John are now no longer just business associates. I consider them truly best friends. And for our final award presentation and why we have named this dinner the Annual Recognition Dinner and the Founders Medal. And, and quite frankly, I've never seen a nicer award given um, in all the many conferences that I attend and dinners that I attend. Uh, I know Pat can take credit for finding the talent, the sculptor that produces this each year. And uh, we have the honor of bringing forward last year's recipient, Commissioner Ralph Basham, to make this presentation to this year's recipient. Commissioner. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, wow, look at this table here. I'm, I'm awed uh, by it, uh, but I, I will tell you one thing. Um, uh, you know, Jay Ahern, back when he was my deputy, he used to say, you know, Ralph, it's all about you. 
But when I, when I was coming up tonight, he said to me, Ralph, it's no longer all about you. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, wow, it's a, it's a pleasure, really a pleasure to be here tonight and to, and to be with you. And um, yeah, it's, it's, and it's a privilege uh, to be here, and it's particularly gratifying uh, to watch this event uh, and this organization uh, receive even greater recognition uh, each year as evidenced by the uh, senior leadership of DHS that you see here taking their time out of their busy schedule uh, to be to attend here tonight and honor our fallen heroes. Uh, we are building a great tradition uh, with this event and as a board member I am personally gra uh, grateful uh, to Secretary Johnson, uh, to Commissioner Kielkowski, uh, to uh, Admiral uh, Zukonk, uh, to Chief Fisher, uh, and uh, even more so to their spouses who are here tonight. So thank you for, thank you <clears throat> for joining. Uh, but it does show uh, the commitment, the leadership of DHS uh, to the men and women uh, on the front lines. Uh, and for any military, homeland security, or law enforcement leader, there is no greater um, honor than being uh, given an award by organizations that support the men and women at the tip of the spear of our country's national security. And there is no finer example of such an award than the Border Patrol Foundation's Founder Medal. Uh, I was humbled and honored to receive this uh, award last year, and I could not be more pleased, and I stand here uh, tonight, uh, as I stand here tonight, to introduce the recipient of this year's Founder Award, the medal. The individual who I am proud to call a former colleague and hopefully still a good friend, Secretary Michael Chertoff. And if I were to... <clears throat> And if I were to ask you to list the five toughest jobs in Washington, D.C. today, I can assure you that the Secretary of Homeland Security would probably make the majority of your list. And quite frankly, after some recent events, maybe even the Director of the Secret Service might make that, <laughs> might make that list. But, uh, but in, uh, in, in all seriously, Secretary Chertoff held one of the truly toughest jobs in Washington, D.C. during one of the most dynamic and challenging times in the department's young history. He was the second secretary of DHS. The department was still in its infancy and only a few years removed from 9-11. The pressure on him and of those who served with him to keep this country safe was enormous. It was truly a transformative time for Homeland Security in the United States, and the country should be incredibly grateful to this man, the Secretary Chertoff, was at the helm. The department and the country is much more secure today because of his effort. But the real uh, secret that most in this room know, and Secretary Chertoff knows better than anyone, is that the men, is the men and women who actually hold the toughest jobs in, in Washington, D.C., or in, in, in the government, are the ones on the front lines. The brave operators who walk the line, who stand the post, and go to work each and every day, knowing that their mission carries great responsibility and their job carries great risk and consequence. So on behalf of those men and women, many of whom are in this room tonight, I am privileged to present the Founders Medal to a, a leader who went to work each and every day thinking about those heroes, Secretary Michael Chertoff. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chert, Mr. Secretary, if, if, you'll, if you'll just remain seated uh, before I call you up. Uh, I'm, I, this is really great to be able to tell him this after what, <laughs> after what he and I went through over the years. You, yeah, you know better than most of that. Um, uh, but someone said they're going to do a short video on your, your life and your contributions. I said, you can't do a short video 
on what this man has done for this country. But please, please enjoy Secretary Michael Chertoff. Good evening and welcome to the 6th Annual Border Patrol Recognition Dinner. I am pleased to congratulate my friend Michael Chertoff on receiving the 2014 Founders Medal. I am fortunate that Mike served in my cabinet as Secretary of Homeland Security and so is our nation. He took on the responsibility of helping safeguard America during the War on Terror, even though it meant resigning his lifetime appointment as a federal judge. Mike's strong leadership of a new and complex agency helped protect the homeland, and I am grateful for his selfless service. Laura and I thank the Border Patrol Foundation. We appreciate your efforts to honor those who have lost their lives while securing our nation's borders and to support the families of the fallen. We thank all of you who contribute to this important cause, and we extend our deepest gratitude to all the men and women of the United States Border Patrol and their families. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless our great country. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Michael Church. <laughs> She's always looking to get to that microphone. You know. <laughs> If I could have Chairman of the Founders Committee, uh, of which the Founders Medal is named after, join us also. Mike? That's a beautiful story. Everybody likes giving me orders now. <coughs> well, I want to thank um, Ralph Basham, who is a valued colleague and a great friend for that very, very kind introduction. And of course, I want to thank President Bush for that very, very kind uh, set of remarks he gave. It really is very, very touching. Uh, Commissioner Kurlikowski and Anna, uh, Chief Fisher and Irene, uh, Admiral Zukunft, I think I've got that right in Fran, and of course, Chief Coburn and Deborah, uh, and Merrill Chertoff, because um, as we all know, everybody who serves, whether they serve in a position on the line or in a position in Washington, is only able to do that because of the support and love of their family. And that's what I think this foundation honors, and it's in that spirit that I'm delighted to accept this award. Um, I'm, I'm very touched by what I saw here today. And I remember, <clears throat> it was about six years ago, when Luis Aguilar was killed, uh, going out to the memorial service and seeing Erica and speaking at that service. It had a very big impact on me. And as I told you a little bit earlier, I have in my house a photograph that was taken in Arizona of the stretch of road where that crime was committed uh, that robbed Luis Aguilar of his life. Uh, we, since that period of time, built a fence there, and hopefully that fence is going to prevent uh, this kind of crime from taking place again. Uh, for those who have lost loved ones in the service and protection of this country, they've made the supreme sacrifice. 
<clears throat> but even for those who've been fortunate enough not to lose someone uh, to uh, crime or to an accident on the border, uh, every day they send a Border Patrol agent out is a day when they wonder, will that person be coming back? And that support and the steadfastness and the love that the family members show to those who man the front lines is what keeps the Border Patrol going and keeps this country safe. And so in many ways, to me, a dinner like this really honors them. Uh, they don't wear a uniform, but they are every bit as much of the service to this country as those who do wear a uniform. It's a very tough job. I had the great good fortune when I was Secretary of Homeland Security to get to visit. Um, I think I must have <clears throat> walked, ridden on horseback, driven an ATV, or flown over every mile of the border, and some of them more than once. Um, I had the opportunity to do some welding in Yuma sector and built part of the fence, and I think I signed a little piece of it. And I, uh, On my last day in the job, on, on January 20th, 2009, I remember Commissioner Basham and Chief Aguilar called me up to say, well, we've built 601 miles of fence. And then soon thereafter, they gave me a little post, which I still have at home, which is a, a piece of what they used to build the fence. So I'm, I'm very acutely aware of what a tough job this is. Um, this is a job where, singly or in pairs, uh, Border Patrol agents are out in some of the most difficult, desolate, and dangerous parts of the United States. Uh, areas where they face not only the threat of very, very bad and dangerous people potentially threatening their lives, but where even traveling in rough terrain, in areas where there may be poor lighting, uh, puts them at risk of, a, of an accident that could have a serious consequence. Um, and in that isolation and manning the ramparts in small groups, they do a tremendous job safeguarding this country and protecting all of us. So I consider myself privileged to have been able to work as a colleague, even though I was in the relative safety of Washington, of these brave men and women. And I salute you, I salute your families. God bless you all. God bless the foundation for the fine work that you do, and God bless America. Thank you very much.